uh, our second CITP lunch uh, seminar of the year. Uh, today's speaker is Merlina Lim. She is uh, one of our visiting scholars this year here. So you'll see her, her office is just over here. Uh, please go and talk to her. Um, she is in normal life, a uh, faculty member at Arizona State University where she has um, quite a few job titles, each one more interesting than the one before. Um, and uh, uh, she is going to talk to us today about um, the intersection between on and offline activism. Thanks. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. I'm excited to be here uh, and looking forward to spend my next, I don't know, eight months uh, here. So uh, I, I have to warn you, I kind of like yesterday I got injected so many drugs. So if I say something stupid <laughs> or something too philosophical, just consider it drugs talking. Uh, sure, here it is, right? In the last three years, we haven't very uh, preoccupied, basically, with this whole online activism, Facebook revolution, Twitter revolution, I don't know, perhaps next time Blackberry revolution, right? Actually, there was the so-called BB riots. Uh-oh. Uh and even my favorite cartoon character, Peanuts and Charlie Brown, started talking about it. Click here to save the world. I find it on online, I don't know who. Essentially, uh, the debates about whether it is social media is a tool for revolution or not, right? Or some people say yes, some people say it is not. It's an old thing. It was in 1990s people were asking about that, whether internet was a tool of democracy or not. and and. Back then, right, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. I kind of remade the cartoon and I said, well, today on the internet, everybody knows you're a dog, right? <laughs> and back then, moreover, Blackberry was a fruit. And now, you know, <laughs> Apple is not a fruit either. So things have changed. And then we shouldn't keep asking the same question, preoccupied with a tool and a very deterministic view about one thing like it's linear, this cause this, right? There is never such thing. There is never one thing cause others. There's always multiple, multiple factors contributing to something. And in the case of revolution, obviously it is a moment, moment, moment that something explodes, being preceded by a set of action. And I'm not gonna solve or not even ask that kind of questions. But my, my, my interest is basically to look at this, this, two, this offline and online, and, and particularly in the making of contemporary social movement, how, what, what are these connections? I just try to go deep into various case studies. I've been doing research predominantly in countries in transition or uh, authoritarian uh, that going through some kind of uh, process, the so-called revolution, whatever it means, uh, or uprising, um, Egypt, Tunisia, or Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, nothing happened there, but there are so many small protests there, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and so on. And uh, I just to give you a sort of a sneak peek. The way I do it is I look at moment, but also I look at doing a lot of uh, historical analysis. Look at before what are key episodes, key moments in in certain place that m influence activism in the region. This is, for example, Arab Spring. It is not true that there was no activism back then. In fact, it, was, it started on the street 99 and uh, online in 2000. Uh, these days actually uh, kind of overlook, but Malaysia has been going through a big change, transformation. And here 
2001, the last election was quite surprising for so many people. But if you look at the historical timeline, you wouldn't be that surprised. You, of course, you don't really know something's going to explode, but you kind of feel it that when uh, there are more activism, obviously people on the ground was trying, were trying to do, to change, to transform something. So how do we want to look at this? Uh, I that digital activism went back maybe 10 or 15 years before people expected it. Is there something um, uh, fundamentally different about digital activism than previous? I mean, pamphleteering, you know, existed for hundreds of years. Um, I imagine the nature of, I mean, you went from the web to mm -hmm. email to Twitter, but... What? In terms of the, the use of media, per se, for activism, there's nothing new. I and mean, people use pamphlet, people use Bible, right? People use uh, uh, railway, right? I mean, you, you always need medium to, to. What is fundamentally different is, especially with social media, which I actually will talk, is that the fact that the connection is, is not only, it's multi-level connection, especially local, could be national, could be global, and go back. And that's, that's something new. But also, uh, in so many other media, you are talking about one-to-many networks or one-to-one -one networks. This is simultaneously one-to-one, one-to-many, and many-to-many. -many. And you actually know. You could map where this network go. And that's fundamentally changed the structure of collective networks. And Collective social movement is essentially collective action. And collective action is about networking. Uh, when the, the way people network with each other is changed, that's also changed collective action. So I look at the, actually look at the interaction between this offline and online, mostly spatially. Uh, and, and I really, try to study the how uh, digital, digital, I try to link digital media with ways the movement are created, expressed, lived, and experienced spatially on locally in physical settings. Uh, how to look at it? First, um, the association between urban space or space, physical space, digital media space and movements first can be, can be understood in relation to networks. Social movement essentially is, uh, especially in the form of protest, can be understood as a network of people who share common objective or and or a common enemy and come together in a series of public display of expression. Uh, and there are three ways to look at the importance of networks in social movement. First, social networks are where social movements are originated and built upon. So this foundation, right, of, of social movement. Second, social networks are the where, the location, where a local con contention is communicated, expressed, and disseminated widely to a large audience and potential participants. And the third, in contemporary social movement, unlike individual uh, spontaneous protests, our network of various politics, contentious politics, and or geographically, ge geographically diverse actions that are associated with each other based on solidarity and collective identity. So the first one, traditionally, uh, social movement built on traditional social network locati locating in specific physical and cultural space. For example, uh, coffee shop, pubs, right? uh, uh, labor union, uh, organization, hobby organization, 
uh, and in, term of, in time of cri crisis, people turn to such network to communicate their grievances and eventually seek opportunities to change the situation. That was historically. In Japan, uh, public bot, for example, traditionally play a very important role. Uh, uh, in in so many uh, so many cultural, there is the so-called civic space where people mingle, right? In contemporary society, such spaces actually are decli in decline. And I argue that many of these activities, just talking away, being associated with each other, actually moving online. So these just civic spaces, not particularly political sometimes, sometimes cultural, sometimes just playing around, right? Soccer, Facebook soccer uh, groups in Egypt are the biggest su support, actually, or I would say the biggest supplier for free riders in Tahrir Square. Because they're like very organized. They chat every time when their team like uh, play against, they have this whole sense of solidarity and nationality. Nationalism is just huge for them, right? So you could override, or do riding on that kind of uh, cohesive, solidarity and turn into something else. But especially in, in authoritarian, authoritarian countries, because civic spaces in physical sense are near impossible. I'm, and I'm not talking necessarily about totally authoritarian like under Egypt under Mubarak. Singapore, for example, or Malaysia, where the gathering in public more than uh, I think four or five people are discouraged. Indonesia under Suharto, you you could everything you ha you get you have to get permission to have gathering, right? So these are naturally social media is a space, and the government didn't really formally didn't really see that as a threat because it's mostly cultural, mostly social. That's I think this all uh, uh, the whole cute, cute cat theory. Uh, maybe I will not go to that. But. So that's uh, the, the the first thing. This is daily mundane socialities, right? Uh, also, so digital media, especially social media, has become integral to the rhythm of everyday mundane sociality. Not particularly, not particularly uh, political, I would say, and especially I think is actually very much related uh, to the culture of entertainment. People actually practice for collective action again and again when they vote for the fans. So it's like this old idol reality shows everywhere in the world, right? They know how to organize. They know how to do to spread things spirally. They remix, mix all kind of messages. Sometimes not political. It was some silly celebrity, right? They've been doing it for some time. But that's precisely where the the apolitical has members that already solid, dense network could be used by activists, which. In all social movement, you need free riders and you need the true believers. True believers could use that, make use that. So that's what I was telling you. And also, there is something the so-called brokerage, right? That is very important in social movement. It's very hard to actually, in some society, it's very hard to be networked when you are of different religion or different ideologies. This is a, in Egypt, in formal politics in Egypt, for example, this is before Tahrir Square, before, uh, in physical, physical setting, it is impossible for 
let's say Muslim Brotherhood, young Muslim, young moderate Muslim Brotherhood, to get to know a female socialist atheist Egyptian, right? But what happened in the blogosphere, for example, and it's happening since 19, mid 19, around 97, 98 in Egypt, right? The true, uh, the, the first blogger, they were just some random Egyptian. They are highly educated, articulate, young. They belong to all kinds. And they got connected. And they, they, when they be driving their friends or their own network, this whole network connect to each other. This brokerage is very important in social movement. When you have no brokering, it's very hard to get a massive participants. And this is possible because precisely because it's online. You, all coincidence also very important. There are more coincidence to meet someone different. And if you are willing to, to be the broker between two groups, you would do it. You can do it online. But also beyond that, uh, social movements are not spontaneous and they first, right? It happens spontaneously as a moment, but you have to make it. Uh, they emerge in a historic condition, evolve gradually through everyday building and expansion of social network and spaces of resistance. Um, and how to make social movement, to create social movement under in a repressive environment? How to create political opportunities and dealing with the constraint. Uh, the first thing is I'm using the, the, the concept of hidden transcript, which is I borrow from James Scott, which is basically a hidden transcript are uh, the critical power that take, that take pla place of states instead of public, right? They are, these are speeches, gesture, and practices that confirm, contradict, and inflect what appear in public transcript, and usually materialize in the form of stories, humor, complaints, songs, and artwork, among others. So in the system where state control information, such as China, Egypt, Tunisia, pre-reform pre Indonesia, and to a certain degree Malaysia and Singapore, spaces where hidden transcripts can be articulated and nurtured are limited. Paradoxically, in the practice, it is the practice of domination, control, and repression that creates the hidden transcript. People are more willing to create hidden transcript when they are under domination. So, and so these are alternative views. Alternative views need alternative space. The, sub, the subordinate needs subaltern. Uh, counter publics vis-a-vis -vis bourgeois see, a public sphere, right? to create venues to undertake communicative processes that were not under the supervision of the authority. And how to do it? Historically, again, historically, religious spaces, churches, black churches, right, or uh, uh, the practice, cultural practices like Congo Square in New Orleans in 19th century, for example. But these are gone. These are impossible in, in the contemporary society, especially under repressive uh, regimes. So here in online is the place where they can cultivate a hidden transcript. Uh, in Tunisia, where Arab Spring the Arab Spring in many ways began, hidden transcript, on, online hidden transcript, can be found as early as 2001 with the creation of Tune, Tune Zin. Zin as a magazine, but also Zin Ben Ali. Uh, the first known online political forum of the country is satirical by nature, uh, became the space where Tunisian discussed taboo political issues but in the form of political satire. 
for example, this is the the picture that they they uh, the poster they circulated about election. It was uh, like comedy because ninety nine percent support Tunisia. Right. But also in other country, for example, uh, in in Indonesia. This is if you are Indonesian, you you find it funny because this is a poster of a uh, soap opera, famous soap opera. But they changed the whole thing with the, this political figure here, very slick. And it is about, uh, it said, when Gecko testifies, uh, this is the one of the image, images that were used to mobilize people to support anti-corruption deputies who were attacked by the police, which is the gecko, small one, by the police, who is a crocodile, well, symbolized by crocodile. Uh, so <coughs> hidden transcript could also be found in the form of the more so serious stories that being uh, revived and repacked, retold, like, like the ones that you wouldn't tell in public, like the story of we are all Khalid Said, for example. The Facebook group was devoted to him, to the political martyr. The story, you couldn't find it on the news, but you ran all kinds of stories, including personal stories and personal imageries. Uh, uh, it was more about, it was actually not so much stories about politics, but stories about victimization that was uh, that really touch people. It's like seeing uh, someone in the American Got Talent whose story touched you so badly that you wanted to put, no matter how bad he was singing, right? Or not how matter bad, or he was not really the best singer, for example, right? It's like that. And this is the, this is the way the process, I'm not trying to undermine the political uh, spec the political aspect of it, but the process is really playing with emotion to create, continuously exploit, exploit the emotional part through story. But also through online, which is this is another, another part that is important in social movement, you, could, you should be able to create a cycle of contentions. If you die, the movement you have to restart, right? And to be able to be, to just almost gone, as if you are gone, right? But you actually making a cycle. The contention is there, it's just people stop talking occasionally, and then, but they're still upset. And then you make a cycle through another story, two different stories, small story, got too big, and, and you have to, through say, share grievances, and you, Keep framing, playing with the framing. Frame it toward something that more unifying is very important. You have to buy space and time. And that's what social media uh, facilitated for, for, for the social movement. But digital network is not inherent to collective movement political per se. Like I said earlier, it's very friendly for uh, pop culture, right? Entertainment, people love to share cute cats or really funny hiccup babies, right? They are not wanting to share some serious person telling stories about nationalism and corruption, right? So complex story fail, don't make it. So the framing is very important and if you, you go to every single uprising, you find actually what you find is oversimplification of problems. In the case of Egypt, for example, Kafaya movement was actually one of the first anti-oppositional movements, not one of the first, the first oppositional movement under, uh, uh, under Mubarak, trying to, to merge online and offline back in 2004. But their message is so complicated, only professors and NGO people understand. Like human rights, 
judicial independence, emergency law, women's rights, people didn't feel they were connected. What, what are, we, we don't need those things, right? When younger people with uh, 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 April uh, youth movement and other younger political activists joined the group and they actually distanced themselves from Kafaya and they started using social media, they make it make the issue more more tangible. This is abstract. This is more concrete. Corruption, torture. You could actually visualize brutality, unemployment, poverty. They get more young people to sign up for uh, their movement. And obviously, we are all college shy. It's a culmination of what this is all about. We are all college shy. We are all that guy got beaten up. His handsome face, right? It's like everybody said how handsome he was before he was beaten up. The juxtaposition of his face, his handsome face and his beaten up face, it's bloody. It's actually invoke a sense of anger, simplify our problem that, hey, we're going to be like him if we didn't get rid of Mubarak. It's, it's us versus them. It is, that's the we moment, actually, translate, mainly because there is a message, a framing is simple enough. And usually victimization is, is a good framing, right? When you could identify what it is. Even in the case of Wasisi, it was a simplification of story because Wasisi never finished, never even went to college. But the fact that the story that went on, went on for a year, actually more than a year, that he was gradu a graduate, became more elaborate, it was said that he was graduate from computer science from Mahdia University, which never happened. And he was slapped by a woman, which is a big thing, big thing in, in Middle East. It was actually, most likely didn't happen. But that story fit the whole classic victimization in story, right? Big guy, small guy. Uh, in the Asia case, gecko, crocodile. Right. Of course, this deputy anti-corruption is not that gecko. They were powerful as well. They were like high rank official. But the whole personification, symbolizing them as gecko is small, works. And the edge of the are all college side. Here is the problem with social media. Complex issue doesn't sell. Because it's just the nature, that's the nature of social media. The network is fast. The production and circulation of information are, is constantly accelerated. The environment is more friendly, genial to simple or simplified narrative than complicated ones. But also social media is not independent from large media system, right? Like the story of this one become big because France TV, BBC, AP suddenly circulated that story. And big media like simplified narratives too. Black and white instead of graying, complicated <laughs> stories. The third, uh, uh, so social media needs to attune to the incredible shrinking sound bite of media in general. The third, social media is not detached from its techno, techno material aspect, namely the distribution of device and its access. First, it is an urban area. If this guy, just some random fender, which actually in six months, within six months, before Boasisi there was nine there were nine the so-called martyrs, they're all street fenders. We didn't hear anything about them. They did exactly the same thing, what he did, burn themselves. We didn't hear about them, right? There were just some random street vendors. 
if this guy was not portrayed as the similar to urban middle class in Tunis, the youth didn't feel they are they were they were they, they, their history didn't resonate with them. Uh, so the high concentration of social media in, in urban areas, uh, the narrative activism ha have to resonate with urban middle class culture as well. But also a high pro proportion of users access social media from mobile devices, especially in these places. It's impossible to get anything complex, really. People read the headline. There was like a research from Pew, 67% of people who forwarded tweets, actually they didn't really read the actual message, right? They glanced to it and then, oh yeah, something that's like blow your mind and just, yeah. So that's the, the, the reality, right? So the framing is important and it's a part of strategy. So, uh, but even with the digital media driven social movement, the claim making, so in making, the claim making is very important in social movement. And the public demonstration, therefore, are st still very part of social movement. Uh, staging uh, movement in the public space still is still perceived as the most power powerful way to collectively express dissent. Uh, so while social media enable you to be to to be invisible, right? Public display of uh, the power itself is clay, claimed through visibility. So the combination of maneuvering in offline and online is actually being able to control where you are visible and invisible. And that's precisely part of the important strategy in challenging the power. Uh, how to maneuver in here is important too. First, you have to be identified, to, to be able to identify the space. And, it, and it's really like very much bound to the availability of spaces. Look at the, this all massive uprising. They are, happen, they are happening in strategic, historic, highly symbolic places, liberation square, liberation, right? Even occupy movement have, happening in place that is so symbolic, right? Uh, which you don't really have that kind of place in Yemen, for example, or in Syria. Uh, but how to, how to get these two together is especially when you talk about you need a lot of people, massive uh, appearance of massive bodies on the street and on the square. Uh, the fact is, like for example, if you look at Tunisia, only two percent of the mobile phone actually have internet connection. So you are not really like here, right? And you could just everybody could access Facebook or something. So the whole, the how to, to create the linkages to other people who, who are not, uh, who are the, who are not online. I look at several places and the intermodality, which is the linkages between one mode of media to others is very important. Uh, this is Indonesia, for example, it, back Back then, this is in the 90s, actually, Internet Cafe became very important place where people, people uh, spread information. For example, from the cafe, people fax, photocopy, Xerox, the material selling on the street through kids who are selling newspaper and snacks, snacks vendors, they, and taxi driver. Very, very important to reach ordinary people who didn't have access to the Internet. In, in the case of Tunisia, was you see, it was actually all kind of modes of media, right? People call 
this Ali Bouazizi to take picture to, to about the, what is happening. He yeah. went there. He posted on Facebook. Al Jazeera called him, found him on Facebook, and then he suddenly, not, he posted 647. By around 8 p.m., he, he was on TV. And then being picked up by French, the video being, being reproduced online, it's going, the story being picked up by Reuters, and France TV put it on YouTube. It's all multimedia, it's not one media. That's the whole intermodality of what one medium is very important to, to create the viral networks of collective action people who are doing things collectively than connective action people who are doing media support to maintain the action, the collective action. It seems to me, uh, especially with the digital media aspect of this, that when you get to the organizing and mobilization and coordination aspects of the social movement, there needs to be some kind of trust because you're going against aggressive governments uh, that are going to come after you. And with that trust, a lot of times I think it would be difficult to do that online, digitally, just like dating. You know, you want to meet the person right, right. that you're going to be going out with. So right. just trusting that their online profile is who they say they are. Right. That's is true. that what you found? Is there a certain point where it has to go face to face? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. Uh, so it has to go to face to face, which I will be talking uh, in the next minute. Uh, but there is something about trust which is interesting that I found among the youth. They have a very different notion of trust because they share pictures with strangers, right? Including some, whoa, pictures, which I wouldn't would know. And I don't consider myself really old <laughs> in that matter. Uh, so, so I think the, the, the whole habits of sharing like it's very easy for them to share things. They didn't even check if it's true or not. Like I was interviewing this very, she's a lecturer, she's a very young lecturer, like 28 years old in Tunisia. She's a very, very famous blogger. He was, she was the one who blogged about what is it? And she didn't check. She just trusted. She just, she was close. He graduated from computer science, the part in computer science from Mahdia University, you know, she wrote a beautiful post, but many stories were not true. But it didn't matter, I guess. In fact, she said it didn't matter. I knew it was wrong in, in, later on, but she never really revised. She said the big message is more important. And, the whole, and that's interesting, right? Where, where for them, which is not the truth, that the truth doesn't matter anymore, which is, which, is, which is bad and good, right? It's bad if the, the aspiration is actually could be wrong in the end, right? I mean, the whole Connie, Connie, I don't know whether you are familiar with Connie, but that's like totally wrong, a lot of wrong thing, and it was successful, very successful, because people just trust it. They didn't care about the truth. This, I'm not talking about young people, just have very different notion of trust. Uh, but what is interesting is the connection between urban and rural areas, which is, I will, this is a story that I'm particularly proud that I got the story, because you don't find it on uh, the newspaper or, uh, so here's the thing. I said earlier that only 2% got smartphone, right? Uh, so we imagine that people are texting each other or people, people like Facebooking each, to each other, but it didn't happen. People couldn't do that. They had no internet connection. So in the past, the way Tunisian government isolated the, the, the protests, which happened actually in 2008, there was six months protests in Gafsa, people were killed. Government just isolated, blocked the road. Journalists couldn't come. Kill electricity, right? And that's it, right? 
you heard nothing, right? The government trying to do the same thing. But what happened was that when uh, in this Gavsta, Kasserin, uh, in these places, in the poorest area of, of uh, Tunisia, that is close to Algeria, they were s sort of like killing, actually, by the same similar operation by the government. The activists, they practice on how to s share the information. The activists got a routine to, they have some posts in several houses where they uh, collect, people could call, with their, because people have cell phone, 98% of Tunisian, they have cell phone. They could call, they could text, there are some numbers, and they could come to those houses to share pictures. These houses, with the activists, they have laptop with internet connection, right? But at that moment, the government kind of shut down the internet, so they couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't do it. So the way people protesting and they were having this all uh, police and being, being chasing, they, they had the cell phone on. And they just call someone at the end, so the other people could call, the the other people could actually record what they are taught, they are hearing. It's almost like a broadcast. It's like a radio rather than cell phone. They just keep it on, and people use pocket cameras and and and, and cell phone to take pictures. In the evening, they sneak in to the house where some activists have laptop, gather all pictures, put it in the USB cards, and the activists put USB card in the sneakers. They went to the border, to Algeria, through the sneaker here, and Algerian activists collect the USB card sent them to Tunis activists who had direct link to Al Jazeera. This is fascinating. Human connectivity through all kind of medium that we didn't imagine. We thought it was easy, but it was not, right? And that's how you cross the people who are from different class, which is actually, they were like ignore. They were marginalized. How they, their voices, their story were, were, were heard by people here who are mostly activists are middle class in Tunis, got to the desk of Al Jazeera. So this is important. This is a very important part of the story of that kind of massive collective action. But also on the street, thing talking about this whole face to face, uh, I got stories that April Youth Movement uh, activists, they said two weeks prior to, to uh, 25th of January, they were, they assigned people. She just went on cab, taking a cab and talking over the phone about 25th uh, gathering. Hey, do, do you know the 25th, gonna, something's going to happen in Tahrir Square? They said that again and again and again, and uh, let me find it, the exact quote. So here was Walid Rashid, an activist. Uh, uh, he said, every time I was in a cab, I would call Ahmed on my cell phone and talk loudly about planning a big protest in Tahrir Square for January 25th. Because I knew that the taxi driver couldn't stop themselves talking about what they had overheard. Uh, eventually, on January 23rd, a cabbie asked me if I had heard about this big demonstration <laughs> that was happening in two days since so comebacks. He said he knew it was successful when it came back to him. Uh, it is a story that's similar in happening in Jakarta and Kuala Lumpur as well. Uh, but also coffee houses. Uh, actually, activists went to coffee houses. They were talking because coffee houses is where people talk about stuff. And when, when within within the, the last uh, 
like within two weeks prior to 25th, did a lot of activists did a lot of face to face, uh, trying to ignite networks that are not online. But also, what is important is that how to use online to sustain the actual happening. Uh, how to to get people to know how to deal with this space because they're soldiers, they're everywhere. Uh, that's gonna how to maneuver here and how where to go, where to run. So this is what what is uh, being there are like more than uh, just 26 pages, but this is one of the page, page uh, pages that I thought is important that uh, step of ca for carrying out the plan it was distributed online on how you how, how to maneuver the place how to get to know if you are from out of town how to get to know at Nuper being in Tahrir Square how to get to know Tahrir Square uh, I think it's important that you could do it prior to the event to know about physical the materiality of social movement But also it's interesting that in different places, in places like Kuala Lumpur, I'm telling you, 87% of people in Kuala Lumpur, they are online through mobile phone and combination, smartphones. But it does, 87% means perhaps only babies and elderly don't really connect, right? So literally everybody. They use the, uh, The internet, social media, very differently if compared to uh, people in Tahrir Square, but not, not that many people, not the big population using internet. The digital and physical are more seamless in, in, in Kuala Lumpur. In the recent, recent uh, protests in, in Kuala Lumpur, for example, you could download this. One of uh, first of three suggested routes for protests, for marching in Kuala Lumpur, you could download it pr prior to the protest day, uh, and I when I mapped the when I mapped the tweets, this is around sixty thousand tweets, sixty-eight thousand tweets within six hours that are very relevant to the protest. Uh, it looks like it is global, just like Tahrir and Tunisia, but when you you look closer. At high concentration in Kuala Lumpur, Penang, uh, in Malaysia, actually high concentration, especially in Kuala Lumpur, and especially in places where there are many people in real time. It's more real time, digital, and, and that's the function of Twitter, for example, is very different. If you look at here, it's very different compared to Egypt. In Egypt and Tunisia, the most tweet, tweeted tweet is uh, news link to the news here they they you look at here it's very place based kind of right this is a, a escape square duduk is in malay is sit sit down back uh, walk scramble push stand access there's more place based people telling each other where to go what is happening uh, it's very place based kind of information and that's, in this case, uh, social media really used in real time to maneuver in space, in urban space, in protest spaces. And also to globalize the movement, I think. While you are bound to local physically, at the same time you want to connect to other bodies that are doing the same thing in other part of the world, in, in the case of Bersih movement in Malaysia, they have all kind of movement using the same hashtag and informing each other. So in Melbourne, Victoria, in, uh, in Australia, in Hong Kong, in Dubai. And the last one, this is the last point that uh, I make. Is also, I think the whole connection is Social media, the online activism could be used to sustain the movement. 
the whole connect collective action, bodies on the street, bodies on the square, they are connected with connective action, people who, who make other people aware. Because the thing about uh, protest or social movement, when you have no witness, you have no protection. You have to make it public stage, and in this case, having, having social media facilitated the globalization, making Tahrir Square a global state that could be watched is actually protecting the people there and sustain the movement so they could keep going on. And that's my last stage, so I'm just concluding. So basically, uh, space is fundamental in exercise of power. My analysis is, it's not one cause the other. And it's, it's not about tool, I think using spatial analysis, you see that it is, sometimes this one is more important than other, but it is, you cannot read them in a the linear. Actually, at different juncture in the process, they play different, different roles and different significance. Uh, what is obvious, the importance of digital media in the formation of social movement uh, cannot be separated first, I think I just summarized, from the reality of contemporary urban condition marked by disappearance of public and sp civic space and the uh, deterioration of traditional social network. Uh, also, social media is neither agent for change or tool of democracy, but, and it's not, it's not always inherently, it's not inherently po political. But the participatory culture that is nurtured in, in social media may potentially be employed to establish and sustain social movement. And beyond providing op new opportunities for uh, cost-effective networking, uh, digital media enable the subordinates to cultivate hidden transcript, create subaltern counter public needed to launch the powerful social movement, uh, it enables social movement to be visible and invisible. But in, but in reality, in practice, the intermodality is very important. The connection between social media and urban space is needed, and that goes beyond the online or offline itself. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'll invite those who need to go to uh, uh, to go, and um, those who want to stick around for discussion, please do. <laughs>